It's often reported in the press that EVs are very inefficient in cold weather. Well, they are less efficient than when the weather is warmer. There's no doubt about that. But that's the same with an ICE vehicle as well. So the whole point of this test is to see by how much the efficiency drops by. Now, a few months ago, we did this test on a 49 mile circuit um, when the temperature was around about 17 degrees Celsius. Today, the temperature is four degrees Celsius, which is about 39 or 40 degrees Fahrenheit. 17 degrees Celsius is around 64 degrees Fahrenheit. So a fair temperature difference from the summer to the, to the autumn. So in terms of the conditions, the conditions of the road are very similar in that it's dry weather, there's not that much wind. In terms of the cabin temperature, we're going to set that at 22 degrees uh, Celsius as we did before, and we're going to drive at a maximum of 55 miles an hour. Prior to that, we're going to stick to the speed limits. So let's get on with the test. So here is the temperature. As you can see, it's four degrees Celsius. Now we're going to convert that into Fahrenheit for you, for those who quite don't understand Celsius, which is very few, I would imagine. So 39 degrees Fahrenheit or four degrees Celsius. And in terms of the trip meter, what we will do is we will um, create a new trip for this. So what we will do is we will reset the trip and rename one low temperature test. And in terms of the temperature, <laughs> And in terms and in terms of the tire pressures, I'll show you those as we drive along. So this is a route, um, 24 and a half miles. We are where the red triangle is. We'll travel west, and then we'll go over the Queens Ferry crossing, and up to Kinross Services. And uh, so that's a route for the day, and that's the route back again. And once we get back, sorry, once we get to Kinross, we'll have a look at the figures, see where we are and then when we come back home we will uh, obviously assess the figures and see what the difference in efficiency was compared to the last test. Now from the front binnacle you can see on the right hand side there are some dots on that display. Now that shows you that the battery hasn't quite warmed up yet and so that gives you a bit more realism to the test in the sense that when you start your car in the morning you're your battery is not going to be warm, it's going to be cold. So this is really a cold battery to start with and it'll take several miles for it to warm up to get up to temperature. And once it does, I'll uh, let you know at uh, what distance that actually warmed up at. Now heading out of Edinburgh, the traffic is still quite busy so we're not really achieving any kind of great speed. Average speed is about 30 miles an hour so far. But once we cross over this uh, junction here, which is called the Barnton Junction, uh, hopefully we'll be able to speed up a bit more. Now I did say that the roads were quite dry, but uh, as you can see they are still a bit damp. Whether that has an effect on the efficiency or not, I really don't know. I think it does have, it does have a little bit of an efficiency disadvantage, but by how much I think it's very difficult to measure that. Now we are six miles into our journey and we've achieved, we've achieved our, um, our speed that we we're looking for, which is 55 miles an hour now, but the battery is still cold, so a certain amount of energy will be used to heat up the battery as well. So that does go against it. So if, for instance, you had a, a preheated car or a preconditioned car rather, the efficiency would definitely increase. So as I said, we're heading towards the Queen's Ferry crossing um, we'll get there in a few minutes and uh, once we cross over we're only about another uh, I think it's about 17 or 18 miles to go after that So here we are on the Queen's Ferry crossing just uh, Entering that now the speed limit of the Queen's Ferry crossing is actually 70 miles an hour But as you can see the traffic is quite slow. We're still doing 55 miles an hour. We're not holding anybody back now, for those who don't know, Queen's Ferry Crossing was open around 2017, I think, um, because the fourth road bridge um, next door uh, was uh, was uh, falling apart to a certain degree. So they, so the fourth, so the Queen's Ferry Crossing opened in 2017, but um, in my view, they've missed a few things here. They've not put in a uh, cycle path, or they've not put in a pedestrian footpath as it was on the 4th Road Bridge, which is unfortunate. 
Um, so you can't actually walk across this bridge, you can't cycle across this bridge. The only way you can get across is by car, um, which I think is a step backwards. But uh, as I said, we are where we are. So uh, not long to go now. We've traveled eight miles, so we have another, uh, gosh, another 20 miles to go, I think. I was wrong earlier on when I said 17 miles, so another 20 miles to go before we get to the Kindrell's Crossing, before we get to the Kindrell's Services, rather. I should have mentioned that there are actually three bridges crossing the fourth at this, at this point. There's the fourth rail bridge, which was built at the latter half of the 19th century. Then there was the fourth road bridge, which was built, uh, opened in the 19, early 1960s, I believe. And finally, obviously, the Queen's Ferry Crossing. I'll put a picture uh, up in the corner here so you can see all three of them. And um, it's quite a sight. You can get some good views from uh, South Queen's Ferry if you're ever visiting down there. Now, in order not to um, make this test too biased, what we're doing is we're overtaking this truck on the left-hand side. We're just slightly increasing our speed to overtake it. Otherwise, if we're caught in, if we, if we drive behind it, that can make the car seem more efficient than it actually is. So we don't want to be driving behind a truck because that will obviously uh, increase the efficiency. So that's why we're overtaking this. Just, uh, just for a small period, we're going to exceed our 55 an hour, 55 mile an hour limit, and uh, then we'll set back down to it again once we've overtaken it. So we're 14 miles into our journey, so another 10 miles to go and the temperature is still 4 degrees Celsius and the, as I said the air conditioning is set at 22 as it was last time. So everything's fairly steady. Um, if the traffic clears up a bit, as in if it gets a bit quieter, I'll show you how the autopilot works um, because that's quite a main feature on, this, uh, on the Tesla. What you find is that on all Teslas, no matter which one you buy new, um, the autopilot will come as standard. And some people think that this is just a gimmick, but it's not. Um, what the autopilot does is that it, it uh, calculates the distance from yourself and the car ahead, and it keeps that distance ahead, keeps the distance equal, and it also keeps the car in the center of the, it keeps the car in the center of the lane. And it, it does it remarkably well. And also when you're overtaking, um, all you have to do is touch the indicator stop once and it'll check whether there is a car approaching and if there isn't, it will overtake the car, it will, it will change lanes rather. So it's a very effective system, a lot of companies have it nowadays, there's no doubt about that, but with the autopilot system, the, the road does not have to be mapped ahead as it is with some car manufacturers such as GM and I think Ford as well. So this is, this you can drive on any unmapped road, which is a great advantage. So I'll show you, I'll just show you how it works in a moment. So the reason it's so important to use the same road there and back is, as you can see now we're on a downhill gradient. And so if we don't use the same road back, um, it'll give a, distinct advantage or it'll give you a false reading in terms of it'll show you the car is more efficient than it actually is but since we're going to be driving back up this road that will equal things out so here's the ideal opportunity to show you how the autopilot works to change lane all you have to do is touch the stock once and the car will move over to the outside lane and if you want to move back in again all you do, you touch the stock once and the car will move back again. Now in North America, or I think in North America as in US and Canada, the rules are slightly different in the sense that the car will do this by itself. You don't actually have to touch the indicator stocks. But uh, in the UK they have uh, taken that uh, feature off because the UK government doesn't agree with it at the moment. But there are three versions of autopilot at the moment. There's a standard version that you get on the car where it will not um, change lanes by itself in the sense that it will only steer and keep the distance ahead from the car itself and then there is what we have in this car which is called um, um, enhanced autopilot and what you get with that uh, package is that it will parallel park it will uh, bay park 
and also it will change lanes with, by touching the stop once and it will also do summon as well and then there is the full self driving package which is only available in the United States not even in Canada and what that does is that effectively you can just enter a point on your satellite navigation and the car will effectively take you there through city streets as well and through highways and now eventually that's the dream the dream is that will uh, come to all parts of the world eventually but at the moment it's only active in the United States but even then it's not perfect there are a certain number of interventions that the drivers have to take along the way depending on the route but as I said through time that is what the target is now I myself have used autopilot uh, several times when I'm traveling and it has actually saved me from serious injury now there was a time when I actually uh, got a bit drowsy and if the autopilot was not on I would have probably ended up in the crash barrier so it's a system that I endorse fully um, if you haven't tried it you certainly should try it and I think you'd be hard pressed not to be impressed by it and if you haven't bought it for your Tesla if you only do city driving in the UK then perhaps it's not, not worth buying but if you're doing long distance driving it definitely does help it just takes the fatigue out of driving because effectively you are a passenger in your own car I mean you do have to concentrate but a lot less and the heavy lifting is taken is, is done by the by the software so we're approaching our exit just one mile to the Kindrel services and we'll be there shortly now take exit six on the left Here we are entering Kindross Services. So we've parked up at Kindross Services. Um, just to make things a bit quieter, I'm going to switch off the air conditioning so it makes it a bit easier for you to hear me. So um, we have travelled 24 miles, it's actually 24 and a half miles, and used 9 kilowatts of 9 kilowatt hours of energy at a rate of 374 watt hours per mile. Now, 374 watt hours per mile doesn't mean an awful lot to most people. So to convert that into um, kilowatt hours used, or rather miles traveled per kilowatt hour, it's a very simple calculation. It's just a thousand divided by 374 or um, 24 divided by nine. Um, so it's very straightforward. And that gives us an answer of 2.67 miles traveled per kilowatt hour. Now. At this stage, when the temperature was around 17 degrees Celsius, I think we were about three and a half miles traveled per kilowatt hour. Now the temperatures dropped even further to three degrees Celsius, which is 37 degrees Fahrenheit. So it shows you a considerable difference. So the thing is, we'll head back home to Edinburgh now. And um, once we've done the full journey, we'll go over the final figures. But before then, let's have a look at those uh, new, super, new superchargers. So these are installed by a company called GridServe. They're quite uh, large in the UK. But I think these ones, these superchargers are um, pay as you go. As far as I'm aware, you don't need a membership. But uh, let's see how these work. So all you do is you plug in your vehicle, use your card, contactless, phone or card, and then that's it, simple and straightforward. And it is a CCS type adapter, and that's a payment card at the bottom. So very similar to the new version four Tesla superchargers. Um, and these are, as I said, in a fair number of places around the UK. And the advantage of these ones is that they have a longer cable. Um, so you can stretch it all the way around to the back of the car if that's where your port is. But I think these ones are up to 150 kilowatt hours. One, sorry, 150 kilowatt chargers, these ones. So that'll be quite, uh, quite a good addition to the service station here. But one thing I did notice is the cost of the electricity. Now, if you were at, at a Tesla supercharger, um, 
the electricity would cost you around 45 pence a kilowatt hour. This company is charging 79 pence a kilowatt hour. So quite a difference in cost. So that's us off to Edinburgh now. Um, it should take us about 30 minutes to get there, I think. And once we get there, as I said earlier on, we'll go through the final figures and look at the efficiency rating as in during the warmer temperature and today's temperature, which has now fallen again to three degrees Celsius. So we're approaching the Queen's Ferry crossing once again. Uh, that means we are just 10 miles away from our final destination. And uh, once we get there, we'll be looking at the figures and a final summary. From our starting point, as you can see, we traveled 49 miles using 16 kilowatt hours of energy, average consumption of 339 watt hours per mile. So what is that actually, what is that equivalent to? So that's the equivalent of 2.95 miles traveled per kilowatt hour. Now, so 2.95 miles um, compared to 3.77 in the summer. And uh, so that's a drop of 22%. Now in the summer, the temperature was uh, 17 degrees Celsius. Now you might find that strange, 17 degrees Celsius in the summer, but that's as warm as it gets here pretty much, unfortunately. So, so uh, uh, 3.77 miles traveled in the summer and 2.95 miles traveled in the winter on one kilowatt hour of energy. So as I said, a drop of 22%. And so that's quite a considerable drop, 22%. I'm not sure what the equivalent um, combustion engine car would drop in efficiency. That's something that perhaps someone can educate me on. Um, but uh, we will try that test as well um, in due course. So that's the end of this video. Uh, please like and subscribe and share if you've learned anything new. And um, I'll catch you in the next one.